Good morning. We are looking at chapter 10.5 titled rotational motion, but really I think these are more uh, better title would be net torque for these problems. Um, we've already seen situations where net torque equals zero, but what we haven't discussed yet is what happens when you do apply a net torque. So a series of questions here to get us thinking about that, starting with to keep an object from moving linearly, there must be no net. And then, of course, hopefully what you're thinking right now is if an object is not moving, there's no net force acting on it, right? I mean, it could be moving at a constant speed, but let's just start off with keeping it simple. Um, not moving, uh, no net force, no acceleration, okay? Now, we move into Chapter 10, rotational motion. To keep an object from spinning or from starting to spin, we need to have no net torque. So we recognize that the two sentences that you see there have so much symmetry to them, dealing with linear acceleration and angular acceleration. Um, let me keep going here. First picture, we apply a force to an object's center of mass. All right, so now um, we talked a little bit about center of mass very quickly. I think I only used a broomstick as an example. I didn't really use anything else as an example. Um, Maybe, maybe I just start with this picture that we see right here and we just use one of these wheels. I don't know why I used a square uh, when I originally made these notes. It would make more sense that we talk about something circular. This first picture wouldn't matter. If you don't want this object to accelerate, then you don't apply a force. But if you do apply a force and you apply it in the direction of its center of mass. Now, I'm going to assume that this is rather uniform. Turns out that, you know, when you buy cheap, uh, I don't know what these were for, like uh, lawn mowers or something like that. When you buy cheap lawn mower wheels on Amazon, you're going to get a wheel that's not very well balanced, but it's close enough that we can say that the center of mass is right at its center. Just like our meter stick, the center of mass is right at the center of the meter stick. Um, if it's laying down on its side and I push on it in a direction that is lined up right with its center of mass, of course, we get a force, we get an acceleration in the direction of the force, right? That makes sense. That's what we learned back in chapter five when we were learning about Newton's laws and studying forces. So now what happens when I apply a force at an angle? So there's a little tiny screw on here that we would use in class. And if we do come back, this will be something that we do in class. If you apply a force off to the side here, so where that little screw is at, if I apply a force here, we see that instead it causes it to rotate. In other words, we get an angular acceleration instead. So that's what the next picture is about, is just showing that if you apply a force outside of an object's center of mass, you're going to get an angular acceleration. Now, of course, that implies that whatever, whatever this is sitting on, like for example, this has a little, um, I don't know, if we want to call that an axle. Maybe it's more what an axle fits through. So there's really its bearings, but it's sitting a little bit raised so that the wheel itself is not sitting on the table. Only that little axle is. If there is friction there, then when I push on the side here, we don't get any sliding, right? So the friction helps with this, which really friction is what helps make wheels work in the first place. And we'll talk about that once we stand the wheel up onto a board, which I have in a picture in a moment. Um, the last question of your homework assignment today, it might even be that there's an example here actually, uh, is analyzing what you see here with this wheel where it's um, you know set up vertically. So we have it set up vertically and um, I have a, a thread or a string attached to that same screw. And if I can do all this while I'm sitting, I don't think I can. Um, first thing I would like to say about this wheel is that it probably doesn't have very good balance, like I said, but we could find its center of mass. I tried to do this before class started, uh, and then, of course, the wheel that I picked here is an epic failure. Um, because these are so out of balance, what I was hoping was that if I attached a small string so that this wouldn't hit the floor and attached it to the wheel, that what we would see is that it would hang straight down. Of course, it's I got to get it out here over the edge of the table. It doesn't hang straight down. So uh, how can I fix this problem here that we can see it better? I should have got a taller ring stand, but then I'd be having to try to make the uh, camera work up really high. That's about, there we go. That'll work. Perfect. Okay. Just barely 
stays above the table. Let's make sure that you know for sure that it's not at the table. Okay, so an interesting thing about what you see right now with this, if you can see it okay with the mass hanging down, is that screw is not directly below the axle. What that tells me is that this wheel is so out of balance that the center of mass of this entire system, including the mass that's hanging from it, all has its center right there. So I'm guessing there must be a heavy spot somewhere on this part of the rubber of the wheel. And that heavy spot is now basically creating an, a, a counter torque to the uh, little mass that is there, such that now the entire thing has its center of mass right directly below what it's hanging from, okay? We would see more of these in class. You can look this up on YouTube in order to, to see this better. Um, now, if I take this mass and I place it on top, I'll place it with the screw up there. There should be some place where I could set this oh, without the mass falling down. Where when it's just right, it doesn't move. Okay. So what you're seeing right now is all of this, its center of mass of the wheel plus that little mass right there is now directly over the center. So when I rotated this around, I made that heavy spot go over to, to this side now. So with the heavy spot here and that extra little mass here, the entire center of mass is directly over that axle, which is why it's not getting a net torque. It's not angularly accelerating, okay? So just some basic understanding of how it works. Uh, your body, your center of mass is around your belly button and uh, your feet have length and also you spread your legs a little bit wide so that your center of mass is always directly over your base. That way you don't topple over. Um, now, when you get a net torque, what you get here instead of like net force, mass times acceleration, instead what we get is a angular mass, which is called moment of inertia, times angular acceleration. Now, why does, why is there a, what is this whole idea of moment of inertia? It's kind of like the inertia of something that is going in a circle. I mean, that was kind of a dumb comment, but it really, it's the inertia of something going in a circle, just like for F net, mass is the inertia of something that's going in a straight line. Now, why are they different is because the inertia of something going in a circle uh, distributes its mass in different places. Like for example, our wheel here, it distributes its mass mostly around the outer edge. It's a really thick, hard rubber that's very heavy with a very lightweight plastic as the spokes of the actual wheel. So it's almost like this is just a uniform disc. There is a little bit of mass here in the center, I suppose, just to, because it's for a um, lawnmower. But like a bicycle wheel, especially when you look at a front wheel that doesn't have the gears on it, there is so little mass anywhere on that wheel besides on the outer edge. And even then there's not a lot of mass like if it's a road bike. And so you don't have a lot of angular inertia or in other words, moment of inertia. Therefore it's easy to get it to go moving really fast. Okay, now there was a question on an AP test a few years back and you'll see it here real soon, probably in this chapter. And if not, it'll be in one of the reviews that basically analyzes a wheel. And I don't even think they start with it on flat ground. I think they move it directly onto a, an incline, onto a hill. Um, and we're supposed to draw the forces. So when you draw the forces acting on this uh, wheel, um, how about we start with our old favorite, force of gravity. Now we have to be more specific with our force of gravity now because it should always come from the center of mass of an object. So my force of gravity looks like that. All right. Now, the reason why this wheel isn't moving is because there's a normal force that looks like that. And really, the normal force should come from the surface that is holding up the wheel. And therefore, we would no longer draw this picture like this. Not in Chapter 10. We can't draw the picture like we did back in Chapter 5. We now have to draw it where there is uh, the forces are coming from the spot that they actually are occurring. All right, so that is important. You need to do that. All right, so now in our second picture here, we put the wheel on an incline. Now you'll notice something different about the force of gravity. In the first picture, the force of gravity is directed directly over the base. 
So the FN and the FG are equal and opposite, even though they don't come out of the same spot, they point perfectly parallel to each other and cancel each other out. The wheel doesn't move. But in this picture here, our F net is not directed over the base. The normal force, of course, has to come from the base like so. And now when you add those two forces, oops, sorry. Now you don't need to draw this part right here, but if you add those two forces, you can see that there is a, you know, here's our FG and here's our FN. I'm not writing very well, I apologize. That this little gap here creates our F net. All right. Um, except that there's one more thing, and I didn't put this into the picture on this slide, and I want you to include this in the picture, is the reason why the wheel doesn't slip down the incline is because there's a friction force right here. And really now all three of those forces, so let's start with red pointing straight down, then blue pointing this way, and then green pointing this way, those three forces do cancel out. Those forces cancel out because those forces don't allow the wheel to slip. We know that a wheel on an incline, you know, I mean, you know, put it a, a rubber tire onto a not very steep incline um, and make it of like concrete, right, or pavement. This wheel's not going to slip. It's just going to stay there. So we know the forces cancel out, but what doesn't cancel out is the fact that there's a net torque. Now, which one do you want to say creates the net torque? Well, to me, I want to pick on that friction force because that's the one that's perpendicular to the wheel center. Um, mm, I still like that best in terms of me describing the physics of how I make a net torque of this. But in terms of the concept of the physics of this, I want to say it's the fact that the force of gravity is not over its base. Its center of mass is not over its base, which means it's going to allow it to try to torque. It's going to try to angularly accelerate. Okay, let's not be too worried about the what force to use to make the uh, angular acceleration in this picture. They didn't do that on the AP test, which means that other teachers who wrote that AP test struggled with how would they get students to correctly uh, identify the angular acceleration with these forces that are there. We'll keep it more like what you see in behind me here with this wheel, where it's nice and simple what creates the net torque. The mass that just fell down hit me in the back. Picked a small one though, it didn't hurt. All right, a moment ago I talked about moments of inertia. Maybe before I even mention the picture on the side here, let's just talk about the first law of rotation. An object at rest stays at rest. A body in rotation tends to keep that rotation also acted on by a net torque. Spinning objects have rotational inertia, also called the moment of inertia, not movement of inertia. I mean, maybe there's a term like that. Did I take that out of the textbook or did I make a mistake at some point in time? I know that I wrote these notes originally here. I was just a couple years into teaching. I wasn't even teaching a high level physics class at the time. I was teaching a low level physics class. And it's possible that low level textbook used the phrase movement of inertia instead of moment. They would do that because it was being taught to, to uh, sophomores in high school that didn't go into chemistry. They took uh, life science and then physical science type class. Um, just like moving objects have inertia, which depends on mass, spinning objects have rotational inertia, which depends on mass and its distribution. That's where all of these pictures come into play. Each type of structure has its own value for the moment of inertia, I. Uh, the further the mass is from the center, the larger the value of the I. So, for example, if we were to pick on um, the disk that is spinning, versus the ring that is spinning. You know, if you could take the entire weight of this disc, maybe this disc is made of wood, and then put it into this ring, make it, maybe instead have it made of like iron, so that it would be the same weight. Notice that the moment of inertia is one whole MR squared versus only one half MR squared. In other words, you only have half as much moment of inertia which means that in your net torque equation, when we say net torque equals I times alpha, if you apply the same torque, right? Spin them, spin them with your hand. There's your force that you're going to apply. Something that has less moment of inertia, the disc, is going to have greater acceleration. So if you take a disc and a ring and put them side by side on this hill from the previous problem, 
the rain is going to be slower and the disc is going to get sliding or rolling down that incline much faster. That's actually part of one of the labs that we would do in class. Anyway, those are all of those things. Two examples and we'll get you out of here. A lab group sets up a torque experiment as shown. Does the meter stick fall? Of course it falls because the meter stick center of mass is right here. The location of where the meter stick is being supported is at its end. So in, in the end here, what we have is a force applied this way. Now it's supposed to be an F, but the pen was way behind me. A force, which is the weight of the meter stick. And if you want to, we could also include that there is a force over here, which is really a normal force, the fulcrum pushing up on it. Now those two forces could be equal and opposite. They are equal and opposite. And they cancel each other out such that the meter stick does not uh, accelerate upward or downward linearly. But even though they are equal and opposite forces, they are not, the torque is not. There is an unbalanced torque here. The torque caused by the fact that the center of mass is not over the location of the normal force. If it was being, if we move this fulcrum over to the middle, meter stick stays balanced. But because it's off like that, it makes sense that it's going to fall. You should all be able to look at that and say, of course it's going to fall. So you make a net torque equation. Net torque equation says the torque caused by the meter stick itself. Because you think it's going to accelerate, I times alpha equals F times R. Hey, we know this, F times R. Uh, 100 gram meter stick would be one Newton. And the distance from where it's rotating to where the center of mass is, is 50 centimeters. This time we do have to change it to meters. Now we're trying to find the angular acceleration. So the only thing that I have left to do is to fill in I. So I go back to this slide and I'm going to find a stick. Here's a slender rod and it's rotating about its end. Therefore, I'm going to use one third ML squared. Oh, I went the wrong direction. One third ML squared. Now, the reason it's not an R is because of the fact that it's a rod. They want us to use its entire length not just to its center of mass. So we don't want to distinguish between R and L. L is the entire length. So one meter long squared mass of 100 grams is 0.1 kilograms and one third is one third. And then we use all that to solve for alpha. Not too hard, is it? Reminds us a lot of net forces, pretty easy stuff. 15 radians per second squared. Mr. Purser, how'd those units work out to be radians per second squared? You don't care. You know it's angular acceleration. The only It would work out if we went through all of this. The only thing that would be missing is the radians. Magic unit. Put it in when you need it. Last example. So here's the one that you see here as our wheel. Let me find where that mass slid off to. And let's set this up the way we would in class. So we're going to use a longer string just so that we can get a uh, a greater distance that it falls. So what you would do in class is you would wind this up. Wind this up until we get to the point where the mass is perfectly on the side here. Now, where the force is being exerted is right there where the mass is suspended from. So like right there. So that's perpendicular to the, uh, to the center, to the fulcrum, right? So as we Go to as we go to drop this. I know this is kind of far away. Maybe if I bring it in a little closer, we can see it. You're going to lose the mass here in a moment. But the the point is, I don't care about the mass. What I care about is the tension. The mass is not the tension. That's what makes example two so hard. The weight of the mass is not the tension force. The weight of the mass is part of an F net equation that helps us with the tension force. But the tension force is what creates the torque. So as I let go of this, we, what we would do in class is we take a timer and a meter stick and measure the mass falling. Maybe this could make a, it's still a good at-home lab, wouldn't it? It's just that you've got to come up with a way to make this work with the supplies that you have, including knowing what your, your mass is here. Maybe it cancels out of the equation. Let's see. Anyway, I let go of it, start timing. Uh, of course, the mass hits the table. You didn't see that, though, and it goes all the way down until, uh, until it hits the ground and we stop timing. And in that time, this wheel was angularly accelerating, right? It was basically 
getting up to a speed, uh, final speed, as the mass then goes to hit the table. All right. So let us get to work on this one and count on this being on your chapter test or something similar. Okay, so free body diagram says that we have the weight of the mass. Up here, we have a tension force, which I am going to dramatically make shorter so we know that they're not equal and opposite. The only time they're equal and opposite is while I hold the wheel. Or if the wheel spins at a constant angular speed, then this would be falling at a constant speed. If it's falling at a constant speed, they're equal and opposite. But if it's accelerating downward, they're not equal and opposite. What is equal and opposite, though, is those tension forces. So if I did a F net equation of just the mass, just the mass. And the reason why I'm not doing a complete F net equation is I don't want the tension force to cancel out. Just the mass, it would say F net equals Fg minus Ft little mass times acceleration equals little mass. Hey, I didn't put the mass there, which means that it's going to cancel out of things. If it's going to cancel out of things, then we can do this as an at-home lab coming up here real soon. Um, I know you're thinking, well, shouldn't you know that? Yeah, I suppose I should, but come on. I have four classes to teach. I got stuff that I'm interested in in my Death Valley when I'm at home. So does this stuff stay in my mind? No. What stays in my mind is I know the physics of it. That's what you guys are practicing. So that when you become engineers, you don't know everything that you get into. It's that you know the physics of it so that you can then do the whatever the engineering requirement is, right? Okay, this died right here because I can't find the tension without the acceleration. I can't find the acceleration without the tension. And I don't even know the mass. And no, it does not cancel out. There's no M in the FT, so we can't cancel that out yet. Uh, but I'll see what I can do with this. If I need it, we'll throw one in there to make the problem solve. Because to me, I feel like I need it because if I don't know it, each mass that I attach to here is going to make this accelerate with a different angular acceleration. I need the mass. So uh, we'll come back to that. Let's, right now, we're still just doing the stuff that gets us a passing score on the AP test, which is uh, looking at the looking at the, the equations of this, just the wheel. I would say uh, net torque equals the torque caused by the tension. Notice that I did not put the mass in there. The mass is not touching the wheel. Net torque equals I times alpha equals FT times R. I for a wheel, we go back to a couple slides ago, for a, uh, a, a wheel is basically a disc is MR squared. Notice I had to look it up. I don't know these things off the top of my head until we start practicing in this chapter. Ah, let's be careful with this. That is not little m. That is big M. That's an R. There's a difference. Big M is the wheel. Little m is the mass. Oh, I do know the mass. Duh, it's right there on it. I know you guys are all sitting there going, you know it, you know it, but I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you through the ether of the uh, internet, okay? And then now I think I just want to do some substitution. So big mass was two kilograms. I'm not sure why I had to write in such a way where I got in the way of my uh, uh, assignment. Two kilograms, one of the two radii cancel out, right? We can cancel out this one with this one because it's still the same radius. Um, and I didn't put the radius of the wheel on there. So that's what's missing. So what is a typical radius of a bicycle wheel based on, uh, on the fact that it says a bike wheel? Um, they're usually 700 uh, centimeters across. So that would be 350 centimeters as a, no, they're seven, not 700, 700 millimeters. So 350 millimeters as a radius. Let's include this. R equals... 0.35 meters, okay? That sounds about right, doesn't it? 35 centimeters from the axle to the outer wheel. So 0.35 and then alpha, which now I'm gonna do another substitution because otherwise alpha creates another variable. Let's leave it for right now, equals FT. Okay, so now my next step is I've got A 
all right, we can go back up in here and put 0.5 newtons means I can call this 0.5, I can call this 0 0.05 times A equals 0.5 minus FT. Still got two unknowns. Down here, I've got another unknown. Let's change A because we learned a few uh, sections ago that uh, A equals R times alpha. Notice how it took me a while to say that because I had to think about the units in order to make these two equal to each other, because I don't always remember if alpha or A is all by itself, so I thought about the units. You have a cheat sheet. Solving for alpha, A over R. And now, really, now the R's cancel out, don't they? I didn't even need to include that, because there was the R right there. So I'm going to change this back to an R so we can see the cancellation of it. And then this becomes F t equals 2a. Let's go and back substitute that in right there and solve it. And I get all of that. You can look over the slide. I know I went over that fast and that's rough because this is a hard question. Do not stop on your assignment. Make sure that you do number 32. Really, there's just a ton of really important problems in this assignment. So make sure that you do all of them. These are very important. Number 27 is important. Practicing the Moments of inertia are important, so make sure you do all of this. All right, see you next time.